But after all, we must remember that art is art. Still, on the other hand, water is water, isn't it? And east is east and west is west. And if you take cranberries and stew them like applesauce, it tastes much more like prunes and rhubarb does. Now, you tell me what you know. Well, I, I would be very glad to give you my opinion. Well, that's dandy. I'll ask you for them someday. Remind me, will you? I'll tell you what. Could you come to my office at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? If I'm not there, ask for Mr. Jamison. That's my secretary. And if he sees you, I'll discharge him. That's the date now, Saturday at 3. No, you better make it Tuesday. I'm going to Europe Monday. Pardon me. My name is Spaulding. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. Episode 50, The Gods Look Down and Laugh. Well, friends, this is Noah Diamond speaking, and we here at the Marx Brothers Council Podcast have always been clear that this is not a film-by-film rewatch. We have made it a point to stagger. I've been staggering around all morning. (laughs) Well, all the jokes can't be good. You've got to expect that once in a while. What I mean is we have spread out our single film deep dive episodes and tried not to do them too close together or in chronological order. And I think it's been a signature theme of this show that there is a lot more to our brothers than the 13 films they made as a team. And just to illustrate that ethos, this is episode 50, and we are just now getting to the last of our deep dives into the proper Marx Brothers films. This does not mean the podcast is ending, nor does it mean that we won't discuss all of the films more in the future, but it does mean that now, 50 episodes in, it is finally time to discuss the movie that all three of your hosts have ranked as our number one favorite on the film rankings page at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. The big store. (laughs) <laughs> the big <laughs> store at last. No, no, you're so silly, Matthew. It is a hundred minute highlights reel of the Marx Brothers best stuff, and it is called Animal Crackers. I want to get us as quickly as possible into our 16 hour discussion of the film. <laughs> but as it's pretty hard to be wrong if I keep answering myself all the time, let's meet my co-hosts and our especially special guest. He is the author of the annotated Marx Brothers and That's Me Groucho and an ever-expanding shelf of other very good books. He claims the whole thing was done with the white of an egg. Presenting the field secretary to Matthew Conium, Matthew Conium. Thank you very much. And just to to, uh, quash any of the the rumours you may have heard, I am not the new King of England. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's, that's a nation's loss. (laughs) <laughs> and that'll mean so much if you're listening to this about six months down the line, but there we are. <laughs> and he is the editor and producer of this show, but don't hold that against him because he's also worked on lots of things you've really enjoyed. One day we will reveal the full measure of his abilities by releasing an unedited episode. We just recite random words from the dictionary and he puts it together to make it seem like we're talking about the Marx Brothers. Presenting... Senor Bob Gassell. Thank you. Thank you. And I prefer from now on you address me by my newly minted name, the Prince of Rittenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Majesty. <sighs> and our guest is the voice of this podcast, the voice you hear at the end of every episode telling you where to find us on the web and so on. She's also a mother of two, a performer, musician, DJ, and event producer, and a big Marx Brothers fan. And if that's not enough to make you feel sympathy, she is also married to Bob Gasell. Woohoo! Yes, folks, it's the other woman in Bob's life that is not the manicurist from A Night at the oh. Opera, but the wonderful Heidi Gasell. Well, thank you for that great intro. I'm so excited to finally be here. Well, Heidi, as you undoubtedly know, we ask all of our guests to start off by giving us their origin story, by telling us how they got involved with the Marx Brothers. Okay. So, um, so my dad actually passed away when I was three. I didn't really know much about him. And there was some film discovered, like, up in our attic when I was a little older. Yeah, it was some home movies of them, right? was like really the only thing I had left of him and I really got into projection and I got into old films there was like this old Abbott and Costello chopped up slapstick thing that came with the projector I actually went and bought a catalog of movies that I wanted to order 
circled off a bunch and uh, we didn't really have a TV all the time. It was my single mom raising me and she, she had a great sense of humor and I had a Jewish upbringing and I, I think that was, you know, just a lot of the humor I was raised with. I never got to buy all the films I wanted, but we'd go into town and, and see some films in New London at the Guard, I think it was. There was like some old theater there. Then when we did have a TV, I would watch old movies. Like I just loved old movies. And I got into Laurel and Hardy and I loved the Marx Brothers. I loved Chaplin and just anything like that I, I really loved. And then fast forward, I moved to Chicago with a couple posters. I had a Chaplin poster and I had the Animal Crackers poster. So I went to college. I went to Columbia College in Chicago and I studied theater and radio and television and improv. So a few months later, I was in an apartment and I was looking for a television set and somebody was selling it. We talked on the phone and we had so much in common. We started talking about Chaplin and Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers and I, I said to him do you do you have any of that and like do you have VHS of this and that and I uh, showed up to his apartment and I remember thinking oh my god like something big's about to happen but it could be like this person's a serial killer and I'm going into his <laughs> apartment and I could get killed I give that vibe don't I <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I met Bob, and, and he actually had the poster. He, he had the catalog that I had when I was a kid. And he actually had films that I circled off and that I wanted. So that was cool. And then I, I just started getting into it more. And for our wedding, we even had a harpist who was dressed as Harpo. Um, and we entered, and we then, entered wearing... <laughs> Groucho glasses and cigars and mustache. We yeah. did. You can see a picture of that. I'm sure you can post that. We had tables named after movies. So we hmm. had an animal crackers table and Who did you put on the Go West table? <laughs> All the people you hate. <laughs> Just like the other day she goes, Why did why did we have a big store table? Like she was like that Yeah, we like, did. <laughs> Dude. Didn't we have a love happy too or something? Yeah. <laughs> Those were people on their last legs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, that's all so wonderful. And I, as a, one who has uh, been lucky enough to see those uh, wedding pictures, um, it's delightful. It's wonderful. And I do certainly encourage everyone listening to look at our blog for some evidence of that uh, <laughs> uh, later on. Well, so beyond the question of how the Marx Brothers made their way into our lives, um, let's focus in on animal crackers, um, and we'll open this up to everybody. Yeah. Uh, early experiences, first encounters with animal crackers, um, how and when did it hit you first? Let me jump in here. Um, I think I had, ex like many people of my generation, I had ex first experienced some animal crackers material on the uh, that record album, the soundtrack of their greatest moments, uh, narrated by Gary Owens, there were quite a number of clips from Animal Crackers in there. And I had heard that, and I'm familiar with it, but I hadn't seen the film. And I had read some of the books, and in some of them had mentioned that it wasn't available or viewing in the U.S., so I just knew about it. And then, I'm going to say it was 1973 or so, an unauthorized copy showed up in... Uh, in Highland Park, Illinois, at a, at a theater, uh, like a midnight type show or something like that. And it was such a wonderful experience. And I think this really helped shape my love of the film is that I first saw this movie, unlike any of the others, I saw it in a theater with an audience of Marx Brothers fans who hadn't seen the film either. And we were all experiencing it for the first time. And it was just, it was, it was like a miracle. You know, as I mentioned before, you know, it's like all of a sudden like, oh, there's another Beatles album you haven't heard. And, you know, and it just pops up. So I saw the film there with an audience. And then a year later, there was the proper re-release. And I opened the newspaper and there's big ads for the Marx Brothers in the movie section. And it was, I went to the downtown, went to a fancy theater and saw it there with a big audience. And it was just one of the highlights of my life and certainly shaped my love of this film. Well, I first saw it um, the same time that I saw 
all the Paramounts, uh, more or less, in one go, which was Christmas 1983 on BBC Two. Uh, they did a Marx Brothers season. Um, but this one was important, particularly because it was the last one. They didn't show them in order. And this was the last one they showed um, after after all the others and even after um, A Night in Casablanca. And it was the only one that I audio recorded on a little a little tape deck just with the with the microphone next to the tv speaker so with all the ambient noise as well people opening and closing doors uh so until uh, video came around and until some more showed up on television that was my one owned piece of of marx brothers this hissing uh poor quality audio of uh, of the soundtrack of that mm. film which i listened to throughout 1984 uh god knows how many times do you still have that tape? I don't. I wish I did. Um, it's long gone, I'm afraid. Like You know, my early viewings of Animal Crackers, I don't have a particular memory of seeing it for the first time. I think I saw it fourth after Duck Soup, Opera, and Races. And I know that I, I identified it right away as, oh, this is what they were like on stage. You know, this is the best film record we have of that. Um, but I don't have a particular memory of my first viewing. I do think it's interesting how this particular Marx Brothers movie is always new again. I mean, the ceremony around its re-release in the 70s, of course, you know, as as Bob details, it presented itself to a generation of fans who had never seen it. And it was this legendary kind of an almost lost film, at least in the United States. So it was new then. Um, and... It also became new again not that long ago when the restored version was released um, in theaters and also on Blu-ray. Uh, of all the films, you know, that, that had that treatment, the five Paramounts, Animal Crackers is the one where the restoration seemed like the biggest deal. Uh, maybe because it's just even more beautifully and thoroughly restored than the others, and it has missing material restored to it. Um, but as much as I've always loved it and considered it peerless among the Marx Brothers films. In 2015 or 16, when the restoration came out, I felt like uh, I'm going to have to watch this hundreds more times uh, in order to get <laughs> get familiar frame by frame with this much enhanced version of it. Also, Animal Crackers itself is, is meaningful to me because it was the first Marx Brothers piece that I saw on stage when I was 15 at the Goodspeed Opera House. Uh, beautiful production uh, with our friends Frank Ferrante and Les Marsden. Uh, Robert Michael Baker played Chico, if you're wondering, and uh, and Craig Rubano played Zeppo. I've talked about that production in my book and how it led to the Alsatia's revival in some ways. But because of that, I this was a Marx Brothers piece where I actually had the stage version and the film version in my head fairly early on and was always watching it from those two perspectives. Let me address something that's sort of the elephant in the room here. Uh, I think everyone needs to know where we're coming from. Um, Animal Crackers is my favorite Marx Brothers film, no doubt. That doesn't necessarily mean it's their best film. Yeah. If you're in the cinema, if you're in the movies, it's hard to make a case that it's a better movie than Duck Soup or Night at the Opera. Those are works of cinema. Those are full-fledged movies. I love this because, it's, to me, it's the best representation of the Marx Brothers as performers and their magic. I mean, they, they're not really helped by the director or the editor or anything else. It's basically just them carrying the show, and they, they do it beautifully. And I just, I just really think that this shows how great they were more than any other work that they, that they put out. Yeah, I agree with yeah, that completely. That's right on the nose. And um, I also think there's there's much to be said for for Joe Adamson's approach, which is to to not really think of them as films at all, but rather as 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 scenes, uh, which are just just mm. uh, you know accidentally corralled into thirteen separate little pens um and and really you 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 should think of them uh, as scene by scene but yes i mean uh, of course it's not a good film in in any uh, sense in which um you know citizen kane is a good film um and if i worried about that sort of thing i might that might even influence me slightly to sort of downgrading it slightly but it doesn't influence me in the least because it's not what i come to these films for Maybe Victor Herman, who directed Animal Crackers, was the best director they ever had, because more than any of the others, he just pointed a camera at them and didn't try too hard to make a movie. It's interesting to me that 
Bob, this is your favorite, just because I've sat through decades of movies with you. And many times we come out of there and you say, yeah, that, that was more of a play than it was a movie. And you usually seem to prefer movies that are movies. And so it really shows that it doesn't have to be a great film, but maybe they're, they're just being who they are here. And that's why you love it so much. I think even their more cinematic movies that came later, it's still true that the main virtue of those films is that they preserved the work of this incredible stage act. Um, and so Animal Crackers doing that a little better, maybe 10% better than any other film, um, makes it my favorite. But there is a lot of truth, not only to the idea that it's a little technically sloppy, um, it really peters out at the end. I mean, Animal Crackers in its final stretch just uh, just kind of deflates, it slowly deflates, and then at some point it's yeah. over and you realize it's ended. You mean how everyone dies at the end? <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Not only does it peter out, but you can it, it's it, you can start to hear it grinding as well, can't you? But once you once you're about an hour and ten minutes into it, um, no matter how much you're enjoying yeah. it, you you feel a bit like yeah. uh, I don't know if you've seen Freddy Got Fingered, but it but it ends with um there's a, there's a crowd scene and you can see a little kid in the crowd holding up a sign saying um, something like uh, how much longer is this fucking film going to go on? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it makes it even more amazing when you think about the fact that the play actually goes on for another act. <laughs> mm, after yes. <laughs> yeah, it's almost literally the first two acts of a three-act play. Um, although, as we'll see, there's other other things that have been changed and moved and, and revised. Well, any other uh, intro matter before we uh, jump into the film? Just that the next time you watch this, think of it more along the lines of those TV versions of musicals that are so big these days, you know, like Annie Live and Bye Bye Birdie, uh, Hamilton. It's that type of presentation. That's what this is like. Uh, yeah. It's not a film. It's not even pretending to be a film. Groucho even makes several references to this being a show, a Broadway show. So that's what you should think of it as. Yeah, and you know, since you bring it up, Bob, it is true that Animal Crackers has often been, it's been sort of assumed that it is a little better than coconuts on all these fronts, more technically accomplished, picture and sound seem a little better. Um, but uh, we have made the point on this show, actually, I should say you have both made this point, and it's so impressive and so true and so rarely spoken. But let, let's just go into it a little. Animal Crackers is actually less cinematic than coconuts, isn't it? Absolutely. Those musical numbers in Coconuts, there's overhead shots and things in the foreground, the camera moving, nothing like that in, in Animal Crackers. You're basically, you're basically in the audience and the camera shooting forward on stage. Yeah, Animal Crackers is, is better preserved. It's in better condition. Um, and I think yeah. that, that kind of fools people a bit because Coconuts looks like it's, it's gone through the shredder. Um, it, it feels a lot, mm. a lot older than it does, uh, than it is, than it was, than it should be. What am I saying? Uh <laughs> a big part of that is the fact that Coconuts was pretty much filmed whole and edited afterwards. We know at least 40 minutes were chopped out after the initial uh, previews, and a lot of things don't make sense. Whereas Animal Crackers, they made whatever changes they needed to make or wanted to make before they started shooting. So it seems a lot more fluid yeah. and coherent compared to the chopped up mess that is uh, the Coconuts. Um, so I've been in the theater and I've done plays and everything and, and so I watched this again and all I could think about was there is something missing. There's something missing and what it is, is the crowd. Like you should really see this in a crowd. And when I saw Say She Is, it was so great because you you get that live feel of the theater and that's what's so cool you know about this and I try to imagine like wow there must have been so many variations of of this like every single night because I remember you know when I've done plays like you go backstage and you're like oh that got a laugh this time that didn't get a laugh this time this audience is heck you know but it must have been something for them to do this over and over again 
Yeah. I wish you could go back in time and just see all these variations of this. That would be cool. And I love the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And you can't really watch it on video at home alone, you know. And I, I feel like this is kind of, it's better with an audience, mm-hmm. I think. I think because Animal Crackers is so dense, it's so packed with jokes. I mean, there's uh, Adamson says, you know, Groucho must have funny lines for everything. He's just got so many to spare. And Matthew, you point out in your book that Groucho seems to have so much good material in this movie that he can throw half of it away, just m- mumble it under his breath. And I, and I think the density of this film is one of the reasons that we feel like we're seeing them on stage. It it feels like we're a little closer to the ad-libbing, unpredictable Marxes that we've all read and heard about than, yeah. than we get in any of the other films. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let's uh, let's uh, unspool the first reel. Huh? This uh, this movie begins with uh, beautiful music, the music of Kalmar and Ruby, heard for the first time in any Marx Brothers movie, uh, and mm-hmm. begins a little bit misleadingly, as you also point out, Matthew, in your book, we start off like feeling like we're very much in an operetta. Hives and the footmen, played by this group called the Music Masters, have their little yeah. opening. It's not even really, a, it's more of a song fragment than a song. Um, the thing I want to say about it is how clever the lyrics are and how Kalmar and Ruby are so good at they're very clever with rhyme, but usually the cleverness isn't that the words they're rhyming are so sophisticated and surprising. It's mm-hmm. it's phrases and um, contextual uses of language that rhyme unexpectedly. Um, it, rhyming that he's being fated by the smart set with on his comfort, you must have your heart set. Uh, you know, rhyming smart and heart is no mm-hmm. big deal, but that's such a good conversational use of language in lyrics. By the way, I highly recommend... Next time you watch the film, for those who have seen it over and over again, put on the closed captioning because I really caught a lot, particularly on that on that opening uh, bit with the with the footmen. It's quite clever what they're singing there. Yeah, it really is. And if you ever anyone ever has a chance to take a look at the stage script, there are more verses to this. Um, mm-hmm. It's a little bit more of a song, although it's still sort of a prelude to the song to come. But it is strange, given that virtually, well, in fact, literally all the other songs. Um, have been removed so it is a a strange editorial decision to to leave that in at the start isn't it yeah i mean i think it's good and works you know it's it it eases us in a little bit but yeah it's very the the beginning of this film is is very singing heavy and then it it's almost totally missing Mm -hmm. um well once we've uh, arrived at this party we quickly and with very economical screen adaptation work from Maury Riskind. We meet Mrs. Rittenhouse, we meet Roscoe W. Chandler, we meet Arabella Rittenhouse, uh, and then it's time to bring on the Marx Brothers. Uh, they do a very good job of making us anticipate the entrance of Captain Spaulding in the same way that the party guests are. The whole song at the beginning, that reminded me of the Pirates of Penzance. No question about it, yes. I, this is, I guess, uh, there may be a flash of it in Coconuts too, but here we really see the Gilbert and Sullivan influence on on Kalmar and Ruby as songwriters. Perhaps that comes also partly from Groucho's enthusiasm for, for Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, our friend Scott K. Ratner would also uh, emphasize that even beyond the songs themselves, there's a Gilbert and Sullivan influence in the way um, the crowd loves Groucho, despite his, you know, not deserving it and being obviously fraudulent um, here in Animal Crackers and then also in Horse Feathers and Duck Soup. That is really the satirical mode we're in. Now, before we dive in too far, let's uh, acknowledge the great uh, supporting cast here. Of course, we got uh, Margaret Dumont and also from the uh, original Broadway show, we got Louis Soren. He's one of the great all-time Marx foils. Uh, I so wish he would have done another film with them, but alas, he didn't. Uh, mm. His reactions are just are just perfect, and uh, I even like his bit before the Marxes show up when he accidentally insults uh, Mrs. Rittenhouse. You are a very beautiful woman. No, no, Mister Chandler. Well, maybe I'm wrong. What? And of course, there's uh, Lillian Roth. Um, it's not often you see a romantic lead in a Marx Brothers film and wish they were on screen more. But 
I want to see more of Arabella Rittenhouse and that whole scene with her and her mom. Uh, I think she's great. She's having so much fun. I guess legend has it that she got sent from California to New York to do this film as some sort of punishment. Uh, hmm. That's punishment. I, I like that kind of punishment. That's good punishment. <laughs> It's one of the things that compares with the stage version in interesting ways. You know, um, Roscoe W. Chandler in the movie is really a composite of two characters from the stage production. The stage version has two love stories and two kind of high society heavies. Chandler is one, and then there's the other guy, uh, Monsieur Doucette, who is the owner of the Bogard. And by combining all of this, not only does it allow the film to move a little faster, it also makes Roscoe W. Chandler a much better and richer part than the version of it Soren had played on stage. Mm -hmm. And it's also true that when you, especially in the stage script, but there are glimmers of it in the movie, you can see how Animal Crackers is a little bit more like a, a George S. Kaufman satirical comedy with the Marx Brothers in it. You know, the other characters have funny lines too, which is not always the case in, in the later films. Um, and that, that Chandler moment that you describe, Bob, it's a great example, you know. He, that's a comedy role too. And um, uh, one line I noticed this morning in the stage script, Grace Carpenter, who has a very small role in the film, but a bigger one in the play, um, she says to the... Uh, to Chandler at one point, I knew we were destined to meet the moment I learned your income. <laughs> <laughs> that, that the role did go to, to, to Sorin, because obviously if it, if it is a composite of two characters and they wanted to cast uh, somebody from the Broadway show, then, then you know both actors would have been in the running, I guess, for it. Um, mm -hmm. Sorin is, is, well, I say Sorin is obviously the right choice. I haven't seen the other guy, but um, Sorin is such a perfect choice that I'm, I'm glad they went for him. That's a good point. I wonder if his uh, his excellent turn in glorifying the American girl the year before yeah. had uh, done made him uh, uh, viable for the film. Matthew, what can you tell us about Lillian Roth? Absolutely nothing. No, I love Lillian Roth. I'm absolutely uh, in love with Lillian Roth. Um, I think an another re another good reason why I think this film is is my favorite is because the supporting cast um are, are so good uh Sorin is great um art garfunkel is great as as lillian's boyfriend and um what <laughs> lillian lillian herself um you know she's just she's just this bubbling wonderful effervescent talent i mean yes the story is that it was a it, you know she was sent over as, as a punishment i suspect that was more uh being being shunted away from hollywood towards new york uh, rather than specifically uh because it was a it was a, an unpleasant experience to work with the marxists um but uh, yeah i mean she's she's great in this she's great in everything so so um try not to be too influenced by by what she became famous for later, which was a kind of a torch singer and an alcoholic who, who's very uh, frank, forthright <laughs> autobiography, um, was made into a, a really rotten film with um, no attempt whatsoever to make the characters that is supposedly her anything like her at all. Uh, but go instead to, to her early 30s films. Uh, they're not particularly well known. They're a little hard to track down, but they're a delight. There's a, they're a Paramount, a little Paramount song short called Meet the Boyfriend. It's absolutely adorable. And of course, my, my favourite American film, Madam Satan by Cecil B. DeMille, in which she plays uh, Trixie, the show girl um in just the most delightful performance uh, it's hard to find uh, people who don't consider her either their favorite marx brothers ingenue or their perhaps their second favorite uh, if they're counting thelma todd as an ingenue so who was in the stage version oh i can tell you uh, uh alice well, you can edit this, Bob, to make it sound like I just had the answer. <laughs> uh, Arab, yeah, Alice Wood. Wow, off the top of your head. Impressive. <laughs> wow, yeah, I just... I'm a fan, Alice Wood. She was in four Broadway shows between 1922 and 1929, and she changed my life. She did. <laughs> you can't make an actress out of wood. <laughs> uh, as with coconuts, the the young romantic leads on stage were not big stars. Um, they were newcomers 
essentially. But in the film versions, they were replaced with big marquee names, like Art Garfunkel. <laughs> and you you really feel that, too. It, it worked out that Lillian Roth was in this part, and I loved her. She was great. And I loved her, her line about um, the, the cattiness, meow. I mean, that's so, like, relevant today because, <laughs> I, like, I saw those women and right away. I was like, wow, they're, they're really catty, you know? <laughs> and I, I didn't know if that was, like, slang back then, but... I don't like that woman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like the fact that she has such a pronounced New York accent, you know, and, and in a way that makes her a little bit like Groucho, you know, in a an early talky world where everyone has this very stilted mid-Atlantic diction. She sounds like a real person. So what's our guess as to what happened to Mr. Rittenhouse? Did he just flee? <laughs> and what about the other one, Mr. White House? What about Mr. White, White House? Is that the right? Or White? White Head. <laughs> I, I have name deficit disorder. I'm sorry. White, Mr. Whitehead. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, because it was like all, all these single ladies, you know, looking for a polygamy. And, you know, they're... My guess is that that Mrs. Whitehead was a was a, a Corrine or something, and she married a rich elderly guy who's now moved on. That would be my, my, my best guess for her. But uh, as, for, as for Mr. Rittenhouse, yeah, I think we should be told. Whatever the answer is, I'll bet he's just using it as an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> the first Marx brother we meet in this film is Zeppo, who gets to tell everyone that Groucho will be here soon. He also gets to sing, or at least speak, <laughs> his way through uh, the lyrics of a, a little intro song. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a melody to it, but he refuses to sing the melody. He just talks his way through mm. I represent the captain who insists on my involving you of these conditions under which he can live. In one thing, he is very strict. He wants his women young and fit, and as for men, he won't have any tramps here. Yeah, if you're curious about what that melody is, just listen to the underscoring, because it's been arranged in such a way that the singer get, can get all the notes from the accompaniment. That's a, a really good way to handle uh, singers who, who might need all the help they can get. But Zeppo doesn't even take the help. Um, I still kind of like the way he does this. Yeah. Uh, it's inexplicable, but um, his his manner and tone when he comes in is kind of great. And even though this movie ultimately is not all that generous with Zeppo, uh, this is promising. I like him coming on, spitting all these bars. He seems very comfortable here, doesn't he? Which he which yeah. he often doesn't. He he seems quite relaxed and and uh, in control of the scene. A yeah, Zeppo absolutely. rarity. Yeah, I guess from having done it on stage. <laughs> There's also a stage convention going on with these entrances. Everyone, every Marx brother gets a big entrance. Um, and that the four people who get big entrances here are the Marx brothers yeah. because they are the Marx brothers. It's not, not like the guest of honor gets a big announced entrance and so does his secretary and two random musicians who happen <laughs> to be at the party. Yeah. And as we've all seen, those of us who have seen the movie a number of times, there are quite a number of people at the top of the stairs also waiting in the crowd at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Back then, nobody was going to pause it and find out there were these mistakes. You could do whatever you wanted, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you saw it once, and then if you wanted to see it again, you had to pay, so... Yeah, yeah I mean, that's true. Like, you know, when you've seen the film a hundred times, you start looking at different things. I, I love watching the those background players during the opening scene. Some of them are stifling laughs. Some of them are trying to act. Others are just trying to be invisible. It's, it's an interesting mix of uh, quote-unquote performances there. It reminds me of, of high school and theater and people kind of standing around and the ensemble, you know. Mm. Some people are more animated. And you know what? I thought that I saw the manicurist in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I paused it and I said to Bob, is that the manicurist, the other woman in your life? And it wasn't. That's the thing about these crowd scenes, though, isn't it? Is, is, is they're basically, by, almost by definition, they're, they're going to be made up of all sorts of different people who don't really want to be there. They're either there <laughs> because they're just getting a small check or they're there because what, where they really want to be is in the front and they're, and they're saying 
look at me, look at me. So, so you get you get this strange mixture. So, so as Bob says, you know, there are some people who are, who are acting in a very kind of silent movie sort of way, reacting to all this stuff going on. Uh, there are others who are, who are just trying to look pretty or handsome, um, and then there are others who are who are literally just taking up space. But never <laughs> do you get the feeling that this is a, a you know a genuine group of people who know each other. Groucho as Captain Jeffrey Spaulding is carried into the room in a, a, a sedan chair. I've also heard it called a rickshaw. A cab. It's a cab. <laughs> a cab. It's in a cab. Um, and pretty soon we are right into some sparkling comedy material and the musical number probably most associated with the Marx Brothers. Hooray for Captain Spaulding. Hooray for Captain Spaulding, the African explorer. He went into the jungle where all the monkeys throw nuts. If I stay here, I'll go nuts. He went on his big island and he What are your thoughts? Well, for a song that is so identified with Groucho, he has relatively little to do in it. He only sings a couple of lines. Uh, he basically just dances around. It's very true. Yeah, it's thought it's a big Groucho song, but you're right. It's mostly a choral number. And as Heidi points out, that's that's partly the Gilbert and Sullivan influence. It's It's the population at large responding to the star much more than it is the star. When he's doing that dance, so he probably had it all choreographed from stage. Yeah, yeah. So he perfected the it. The stage really. script even specifies; uh, it, it's even written into the script. There are names for s- some of the moves he does. It's, it'll say like Spalding, uh, Mechanical Man is one of them. You know, <laughs> yeah. for all of his or Charleston. Yeah, it is true. This is probably the best example we have of Groucho's very idiosyncratic dancing, and it's beautiful. He does another version of this again in Horse Feathers in the opening. The corkscrew yeah, kicks, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so so in the in this song we get the first of the I, I think I'm right in saying the first of the restored pieces that that are in the the, the, the new uh, version of Animal Crackers, which is the the um, the, the, the the most glaring cut in the original film because it's a line of the actual song. I think I'll try and make her, um, which has just vanished in the in the original version. Um, that's that's now back. Um, I think the combination of the fact that it was censored and the fact that the phrase um, has has vanished from from pop- popular use. Um, for those reasons, we tend to think of it now as, I think, as a little more risque than it actually was. Um, I think make in that context may have been widely used to mean uh, sexual intercourse, but I don't think that's what it literally means. I, 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 my assumption is that it's it's derived from make a conquest of. So it it, it could mean that, or, or it, it, it could be much milder. And I think... If it had been um, as explicit as uh, you know, f her, um, it would never have got in the song in in the first place. There are changes to the song. Um, women hot becomes women warm. Bums becomes uh, tramps, and so on. Yeah. So I, I think there's a there's a tendency to uh, to to think of that as as more kind of uh, shocking than than it actually is, and. Obviously, I'm glad it's back. Um, I would hate for John Tefteller to think that I'm arguing for it for it not being back. But a part of me just can't help being a little bit wistful that the version that we know so well that we can talk along with every every line of that was presented to us as the film in its in its finished form has not only been superseded but will now vanish entirely it's never going to be seen it's not going to be an extra you know because there's nothing to it that's different it's it's just got less in it so apart from our old dvds and our old vhs's 
that will disappear. And I, I can't help being a little bit sad about that because <laughs> once, the, once the novelty has gone, once we're talking about another generation on who will have only ever known this version, so you don't get that pleasant feeling of novelty of, whoo, there's an extra line there. All you've got is an extra laugh line that isn't really very funny, uh, an extra laugh line that probably won't get a laugh ever. Um, you know, Scratch LC, great, that's really funny. The Rhino joke. That's really funny. This is is kind of a kind of a duff line, and um, I just a, a little part of me feels a little bit sad. It's okay to feel sad. So why do we think then that that I mean, all all the, all his songs are are good. Basically, they're all funny. They're all I would say about as well known as each other. Uh, why do we think that was the one that became, you know, the theme to You Bet Your Life? And, uh, you know, wh why did that one endure so much and be so associated with him? Perhaps it's because this is the only song in the films that's about Groucho, about his character. Uh, all the other songs in Horse Feathers, Duck Soup, At the Circus, whatever, they're him singing about his thoughts and his plans and his opinions. Here, it's sung mm. to him, about him. Yeah. I guess Dr. Hackenbush might have taken that mantle had that been put into A Day at the Races, but it wasn't, and it didn't. That's a good theory. It, the song is an expression of love for Groucho, mm -hmm. um, and therefore it, it's a natural place to go with our feelings about him. Uh, but I, I think also maybe it's just really catchy yeah. i mean it's it's a little more of an earworm than the other groucho songs i mean those are all wonderful melodies too not to knock them but mm -hmm. i don't know it may, it may just be that this one is instantly memorable you hear it once and you know the tune it's everything i mean his outfit he's so cute and he's so <laughs> elegant and he's so he's just magical you know and when he dances i mean it's amazing but he doesn't have to sing he doesn't have to do any of that and mm. we set it up with oh you gotta be thin and you gotta be young to be in the same room and no tramps allowed and everybody got ready and and there's all this build up so by the time he gets there and and what is it five minutes into the film you're like oh my god there he is finally and then if you are dressing up as groucho for halloween you you probably wear that outfit. That that's you're probably going to be Captain Spaulding. Uh, and it is just true. Um, as, and I'll probably say a lot of things like this over the course of this episode. As great as they always are, and as wonderful as so many of the other films are, here it's just a little more so. And Groucho, Groucho's performance, his presence on screen in this movie, he is beautiful i mean he's magical and more than he ever was any time or anywhere else yeah. this is i think the greatest talking comic performance ever captured by a camera and especially when you compare it to coconuts it's like night and day i mean he's just brimming with confidence he's playing to the camera everything's with a little wink he's so much above the fray entertaining himself entertaining us it's just a perfect balance that as great as some of his later performances were, I don't think it ever hit the sweet spot as well as he does right here. And of course, this is the first time really where he, he uh, knows he's a film star because yeah. Coconuts was just sort of like a, a diversion. You know, his heart was on, was on in Animal Crackers in the evenings on stage. Mm. So he was probably mm. tired and just going through the motions to some extent. Uh, this time uh, he knows that, that uh, there's an audience out there that, that really want to, want to see him deliver the goods. And when you combine that with this uh, brilliant script by Kaufman and Riskin, I mean, I mean, it's hard to top. Uh, I love all these early Marx Brothers films, of course, but but here it's a whole different beast. Here he is doing these wonderfully long monologues and flights of fancy and senses that contradict themselves before they're finished. Uh, I think it was Joe Adamson who says that uh, uh, the script here and Groucho's material in particular reaches a level of sophistication that the later films can't even come close to matching. And and I agree. So the timeline is he, they're doing Animal Crackers on stage and then Coconuts on film. The Coconuts right. on, on At film. At literally the same time, yeah. It's, it's, it feels like a superhuman feet really they're 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 live on stage in the evening and then during the day they're they're toiling over this film 
There's probably something to the idea that the experience of having made and then seen coconuts gave them a little bit of a toolkit to see how they came across on film, how it all translated, and and maybe apply some learned lessons to making Animal Crackers a more confident movie from a performance point of view, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially for Groucho and Chico, uh, who we now meet, having met uh, Captain Spaulding. Chico comes on with the classic Chico swagger and delivers what I think is one of his best dialogue sequences ever. Say, I used to know a fellow looked exactly like you by the name of uh, Emmanuel Ravelli. Are you his brother? I'm Emmanuel Ravelli. You're Emmanuel Ravelli? I'm Emmanuel Ravelli. Well, no wonder you look like him. But I still insist there is a resemblance. <laughs> hey, he thinks I look alike. Well, if you do, it's a tough break for both of you. You are one of the musicians, but you may not do until tomorrow. Couldn't come tomorrow. That's too quick. Say, you're lucky they didn't come yesterday. We were busy yesterday, but we charged just the same. This is better than exploring. What do you fellas get an hour? Oh, for playing, we get $10 an hour. I see. What do you get for not playing? $12 an hour. Now, do we know for a fact that these fellas coming into the party are who they say they are? Okay. Mm -hmm. There was no picture of Captain Spaulding. You know, for for all we know, these could have been the, the same guys who got off the ship and monkey business, they saw a newspaper and decided to crash the party. I mean, when Chico comes in, Margaret Dumont even says, oh, you weren't due till tomorrow. Yeah. So maybe these guys are tied up somewhere and uh, the Marxists <laughs> have come in and assumed their identities. At least in MGM, that's the story we would get. We would have, to have a, a back story as to why they are they are acting like this. We'd see Captain Spaulding in his in his long underwear, tied up in a, in, a, in his uh, ship's cabin. Yeah. <laughs> but what a great thought. I, I do love uh, the way Simon Luvish expresses this in his book. He says that Captain Spaulding is the explorer allegedly just returned from Africa, but he doesn't seem to have come from much farther away than the Carnegie Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we do meet these uh, these characters, frauds though they may be. Um, Chico has his outstanding uh, conversation with Groucho about his rates for not playing and rehearsing. That's yeah, that's wonderful. That's like my favorite little. The Groucho Chico exchange ever. Well, we, you know yeah, what it reminds me of, right, Bob? What's that? Oh, the hay. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll, I'll tell the story. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> when we were planning our wedding, uh, one of the places we considered was this uh, farm in Wisconsin, which hosted events. And we were looking at the items that uh, we could um, use and you know, they had the like campfires and tents and tables and everything. And on the list, it said bales of hay. And there were there was a price, $10. And then in uh, parenthesis next to it, it said, if damaged, 15 And Heidi asked me, why does the damage hay cost more than the regular <laughs> hay? Her thought was that it cost more because they had to spend time damaging it to make it look more, you know, affected and it look more authentic. <laughs> they have to pay people to damage it. <laughs> yeah. So that's why it costs more. Okay. <laughs> that does sound like a business run by the Marx Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about uh, Harpo's, uh, our first moments with Harpo here? I love his entrance and the way he comes in. Mm. As soon as we get to the guns, though, that's, for me, mm. the first time in the movie that I'm a little... Is this funny? I'm not sure this is funny. It's a surprise, yeah. It, sh- it doesn't fit. I mean, it's a holdover from the stage, but they needed to get out of the scene. You know, I'm sure that worked very well yeah. on stage. And those statue people might have had to have been sitting there for like 15, 20 minutes <laughs> on stage and not move. <laughs> and what was that statue of exactly? I mean, that, who has that statue in their house? <laughs> I think on one hand, the statues coming to life and shooting back at Harpo, that feels a little off-brand here. That's the real world being ridiculous instead of the Marx Brothers being ridiculous in a a straight world. Um, On the other hand, it is, you're absolutely right that it's a holdover from the stage, not only because that gag was in the stage version of Animal Crackers, but because the whole idea of statues coming to life was such a standard element of musical comedy and reviews at the time. Ah, um, in I fact, didn't know that. In, in I'll Say She Is, there's a Pygmalion and Galatea ballet about a statue coming to life. And and in his opening night review of I'll Say She Is, Alexander Wilcott says, the show features the usual allotment of statues coming to life. It was just such a standard trope. So we could look at it as a reference to that. 
Yeah, so maybe it, the the fact that the statue comes to life is 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 of no particular consequence, and the the, the joke is that that having once come to life, they that they then enter into a gun battle with our boat, <laughs> and that's the joke, mm -hmm. rather than the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what statues do. That's the joke. They come to life. <laughs> I, I love that that Harpo is the professor, and he has the cigarette <laughs> in his mouth, mm -hmm. and the and mm -hmm. I was reading about in your book that um, how he had different names through time like wacky yeah. kind yeah. of clown names I've, I've done clowning before too but um, the professor is just genius I think it's my favorite name for him yeah definitely yeah, yeah. the era mystery and let's not miss an opportunity to mention that Harpo's entrance music is the song Collegiate by Mo Jaffe and Nat Bonks <laughs> 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 Which Chico plays, doesn't he, in horse feathers? I think. Oh yes, and it's it's Chico's uh, piano solo in horse feathers. Too. Mm -hmm. um, a, a hit song of the twenty, a hit sort of doggerel uh, song of the twenties. Um, all right. Well, now uh, the the plot starts to move. We get more about the painting uh, with Hives and Mrs. Whitehead and and this uh, Mrs. Whitehead's friend Grace Carpenter. We get our first love scene with Lillian Roth. Um, and it's a little Marx Brothers free stretch here um, until we get to uh, Groucho's love. Well, wait, do we, do we have anything to say about Mr. Hal Thompson or the less said the better? Oh, is that who it is? Is that who it is? Hal Thompson. That's who we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a oh, Garfunkel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I have nothing to say about Hal Thompson. <laughs> Does anybody? <laughs> it, he does. I mean, it's not just me, though, is it? He, it, he looks exactly like our Garfunkel on the cover of. Bookends. I could see that. Or is that, ju is that just me? I don't know. <laughs> I get the uh, vibe that Lillian Roth despised them in real life and just could barely get through the scene with them. He's certainly not somebody I would want to rely on in a, in a tight corner, you know, in a, in a fight. <laughs> I don't think that, there's not there's not much to him, is there? <laughs> Um, I'm just looking at um, Google results for him on the fly here. I, I will admit I have done no research into Hal Thompson, but I can see that uh, the most Marxian credits on his resume, other than Animal Crackers, are television versions of The Man Who Came to Dinner mm -hmm. and You Can't Take It With You, both in 1947. You didn't, you didn't watch his biopic? You didn't see that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll cry next week. <laughs> Uh, he played Henderson in You Can't Take It With You and Mr. Stanley in The Man Who Came to Dinner. He reminds me of the guy that played Dagwood. Blondie, he reminds me of that actor. And also the line that I loved. They'll say you're a great artist, you'll get six commissions for painting, and we can be married and divorced in no time. <laughs> That's such yeah. a great line. Yeah. And, and, you know, I love Animal House. And one of my favorite parts is the, the post scene where they say, you know, this couple was married, but then they were divorced. And yeah. it always gets a laugh. Yeah. And, and this was years before that, and that, that's a hilarious line. Just imagine what Thalberg would have made of that, you know, the, the idea that you need these, these young lovers that you care about because you, you, care, you, know, you want them to, to, uh, to, to get married and, and to go off into the sunset together. And here we have two young lovers saying they're going to be married and divorced in no time. <laughs> it's, it's the perfect encapsulation of, of, uh, mm. of what he wouldn't have liked, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, and it's also a perfect encapsulation of the kind of brittle, cynical 20s George Kaufman mm. language that all these characters are speaking. So while we're talking about the painting, where is this painting now? Like, I'm sure, in, I'm sure they had many, many versions they used for the film. Well, well, there's at least three that we see on screen at the same time. And I think I know who painted them. I, I think I don't think it's in, that is in the book. I think we we got that later, and it's sort of in the second edition pile. And you're now going to ask me who it is, and I and they, I can't remember. But uh, I do I do have a, a likely name for the for the guy who who uh, who did the paintings. Is it someone who was doing that kind of work at, at Paramount at the time? At Paramount, mm -hmm. yes, exactly that, yeah. Interesting. You know the version that they unveil later in the film, um, I guess it's that piss poor version done by Grace Carpenter, who, by the way, for decades I thought she was uh, Mrs. Whitehead's daughter. I didn't realize she was a different character. But anyhow, that version of the painting, which is supposedly a bad one, I mean, it looks exactly the same as the, as the original, uh, mm. as far as I could tell. I mean, they don't look any different to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it does not have the soul of the boat. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> and there's a dog missing. <laughs> and there's a dog missing, too. Uh, so Groucho now starts to uh, court Mrs. Rittenhouse. And, and wait, wait, wait. Let me go back for a second. Okay. Did we go by the scene where Ms. Whitehead asked for Hive's help in replacing the painting? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Okay. Why would Hive's go along with this? He's going to be the first person that gets blamed. Chandler trusting him with the painting, then something happens with <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think is going to, who's going to get fired? I mean, maybe he wants to get fired so he could go back. And what's with his body belongs to her? I mean, what what is that? Maybe that's why she's not married anymore. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hives is a strange character here. I mean, he's he's a little bit sketchily drawn and he's basically a plot device. But, you know, he is somewhat sinister, isn't he? He he was he's done time before he tells us later in the film it's handy with the chloroform exactly yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a little bit of, of kaufman you know like hives too is a fraud he, you know it's not just the marx brothers mm. who are posing mm. a, as something they aren't you know he, hives and uh, roscoe w chandler everybody is is a little frowsy yeah. here those women yeah. they're supposed <laughs> to be friends right and they're they're catty bad girls Oh, that's something too that, that uh, like high society is being satirized here in ways that may not really ring true for us anymore. Yeah. But it, um, that's another thing that is a little clearer in the stage version that it's a satire of like social mores of Long Island high society of mm. the 1920s and this idea of like rival society matrons trying to have the big social splash of the season. Mm. Um, there's a lot more of that in the play. It reminded us of the Gilded Age. We watched that. Yeah, I, right. Social satire. Yeah. And then, yeah. um, in the stage version, one of the two uh, male love interests who has been combined with John Parker in the film is named Wally Winston. He's a newspaper columnist, obviously based on Walter Winchell. And he provides a lot of that, too. You know, it's kind of a, a cynical view of uh, the scene that he's covering. Mm -hmm. Uh, this comedy scene with Groucho and Mrs. Rittenhouse and Mrs. Whitehead uh, is is quite something. And yeah. because it doesn't have any other Marx Brothers in it, I always feel a little bad identifying it as my favorite Marx Brothers scene. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think Groucho's ever been better. He's fucking brilliant here. I beg your pardon. Am I intruding? Are you intruding? Just when I had her on the five-yard line. I should say you are intruding. I should say you are intruding, pardon me. I was using the subjunctive instead of the past tense. Yes, we're away past tense. We're living in bungalows now. This is a mechanical age, of course. Uh, Mrs. Whitehead, you haven't met Captain Spaulding, have you? Why, no, I haven't. How are you? How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And how are you? And how are you? That leaves you one up. Did anyone ever tell you you had uh, beautiful eyes? No. Well, you have. And so have you. He shot her a glance, has a smile played around his lips. Yes, I don't think I've ever seen four more beautiful eyes in my life. Well, three anyway. It's like watching like a great acrobat or just, or watching Fred Astaire dance. You know, you just mm -hmm. can't believe what he's doing before mm -hmm. your eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's just a beautiful performance. I I've always noticed that, although I would not want to cut a second out of this, you could actually take out all the strange interludes and still have a really solid comedy scene, even mm -hmm. without them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure our listeners know, but we might as well just say that the, it is a parody of the play Strange Interlude by Eugene O'Neill, which was a recent Broadway hit at the time in which characters would step out of the action and deliver uh, monologues to the audience about their feelings. And it's a good example, isn't it, of, of, of something that is that is intrinsically funny, even if you don't get that, as most people today presumably wouldn't. Uh, it's still funny in its own right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember that when I saw Animal Crackers on stage at Goodspeed in 92, they did something interesting with this scene. Is Every time Groucho, uh, is Frank as Groucho in this case, every time he strode downstage to deliver the strange interlude monologues, the orchestra played music under them. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of airy, spacey, like sort of, I don't know, Philip Glass sounding abstract, dramatic noise. Um, and I think it, it served the purpose it obviously had, which was to just help cue the audience that what we're doing here is we're making fun of serious drama. Could you imagine if somebody had proposed doing this at MGM, like during 
at the circus, <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be like, what the hell are you doing? Get out of here. You know? But it was so modern. I mean, you can look yeah. at movies in the 80s that kind of followed it, even though it was a parody of something else, to break that wall. Yeah, yeah like Ferris Bueller. Talking like to it reminded me of Ferris yeah. Bueller. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Yeah, I love the idea of like a mini parody. That's Mm -hmm. just one scene is a parody of something. Mm -hmm. And the line that I just really loved, and and I hope Bob uses it on me sometime, is, (laughs) would you wash out a pair of socks for me? It means I love you. (laughs) Just say that anytime. (laughs) Well, only if you're going to do it. (laughs) I'm not going to do it. I just want you to say it. It's one of those times when, on reflection, Margaret Dumont's response is just as funny uh, as Groucho's line, when she's, Captain, I'm surprised. (laughs) I love her so much. So if you really watch her during all of these scenes, she just decides to laugh at it. Like, it's ridiculous. And in in real life, like, what, what would you say? But she's laughing with it. She gets the joke. She often seems to be enjoying the Marx Brothers in this movie, and particularly Groucho, I think because she's always with him, and so much of what he does is obviously, you know, meant to inspire laughs. She kind of gives him the laugh a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to talk about the Theater Guild a little bit. When Groucho says, you're lucky the Theater Guild isn't putting this on, and so is the Guild, um, I think it sounds like it may just be a generic reference to it. A, you know, a theater company. Uh, but the Theater Guild is a very specific uh, theatrical society founded in New York City in 1918. Um, and it survives to this day in a somewhat um, smaller form. What the Theater Guild was devoted to was producing non-commercial productions um, on Broadway. Um, and under that banner, they were responsible for the Broadway premieres of lots and lots of great plays, especially the kinds of plays that that we would think of and that were really thought of then as very serious plays. Um, a lot of Eugene O'Neill, for example. Um, and although they don't function so much as a production entity now, that's partly because the rise of nonprofit theater has, you know, lots of entities are now doing what the Theater Guild used to be doing by itself. When I was a kid, I always thought he was saying that they were fortunate that Peter Gill isn't putting it up. And I always always wondered who this guy Peter Gill was. <laughs> he needed to get a better TV, Matthew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Well, I think the next big thing to talk about is Harpo and Chico's encounter with Roscoe W. Chandler um, on that beautiful set of stairs. Oh, man, the staircase. I love that thing. You know, this is such a wonderful scene. Harpo and Chico make mincemeat out of Chandler here. He doesn't do anything to deserve it. He's being friendly enough, but they have their way with him. And usually when somebody's being pickpocketed, they go after, you know, their watch or their money or whatever. But they don't seem interested in anything like that. They get his socks and his tie and his birthmark. (laughs) And, of course, there's that sublime moment when Chandler calls out Chico for not being really Italian. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And here, of course, we get an example of a a lost topical reference, uh, Making Mischief, with so so many books saying that that, um, Chandler is revealed as... um, a fish peddler called Abe Cabibble. Um He isn't, of course. He looks like the cartoon character Abe Cabibble. And the problem is that it's caused unnecessarily by Chico, who who has decided to call him uh, Abe the Fishman. So the fact that he he is called Abe uh, makes makes that mistake uh, almost inevitable. In the play script, I believe he's called Ivan the Fish Peddler. So we're just looking at, at, at uh, Chico deliberately. Uh, sowing the seeds of confusion there. <laughs> I have a question about the, the set again. It was from Broadway or no? It was the from photographs the... I've seen from the original Animal Crackers, I don't think I've seen one that would could definitively tell us exactly what Rittenhouse Manor looked like on stage. Um, I'm sure those photos exist. I have seen Coconuts photos, very detailed pictures of the Coconuts set. And that one is, although all the same stuff, definitely not the same design they used in the movie. Um, you know, they've got the hotel lobby with the, the round uh, reception desk, but completely different looking furniture. 
Um, but that's a good question. I, I, I would love to, to be able to answer that authoritatively and tell you more about what this looked like. On yeah, Broadway. it felt like a fourth player, you know, just when they're running up and down the stairs and Bob's watching and he's like, I love this set. <laughs> it's so cool. And it is. It's, it, and it makes <laughs> and it For me to even notice something like that. Yeah. Bob did a, a thing where he, he took a series of freeze frames of Marx Brothers sets before the characters come on or at moments when the characters aren't there. Uh, and he did a lovely freeze frame of just of just that set with nobody on it, uh, which I've still got framed. I, I printed it off and blew it up and framed it. Yeah. You, want me to, you want me to sign that for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, after Harpo and Chico make mincemeat of uh, Roscoe W. Chandler, the Poor man has to endure the same treatment, more or less, from Groucho. (laughs) In yet another scene, this is like our fourth or fifth comedy scene in a row that just goes on the list of the greatest scenes ever. Groucho and Chandler. What's so great about this, and you know, for those of you wondering why we love this movie so much, we get basically four and a half minutes of Groucho and and Chandler just sitting at this table talking it has nothing to do with the rest of the film or the plot or character development or anything. It's just there to make us laugh. And it's just Kaufman and Groucho at the top of their game. We're never going to see anything like this again. Yeah, beautifully mm-hmm. put and so true. And and there's something about, uh, it's like this scene and the strange interlude scene and other times too. I feel like these are Groucho's solos this is his specialty yeah. material it's like harpo's harp solo or chico's piano just put the camera on him and, and let him do it and groucho plays his own personality as though it's a musical instrument in these scenes mm-hmm. people uh to this day often assume that the deliberate flub where they confuse each other's names must be real because the acting is so good they're they're so convincing uh, but of course not only is it carefully rehearsed, it's in the stage script. You can sort of tell that Groucho and Soren have done this many times before. Yeah, you, you wouldn't necessarily think this would be the, the best way to do this. Groucho's straight man here is another somewhat fraudulent, suspicious character with a mustache and a tailcoat. I mean, it might almost seem like he's too similar to Groucho to be his Dumont or his Sig Ruman, but boy, does this work. Mm-hmm. He looks rather like Frenchie as well, doesn't he? Yeah. Is this when he he introduces himself and says the T stands for Edgar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the way he asks, what do you think the T stands for? He's setting him up for failure. Yeah. <laughs> and also that Chandler takes a guess at it rather than says, I don't know. <laughs> he says, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, good, he's a good sport, Chandler. Yeah. Um, all right. Lillian Roth asks Chico to help her with her plan to swap the paintings, same plan that uh, Mrs. Whitehead has has also come up with. Um, And that leads us into uh, a very memorable, famous, Mm -hmm. (laughs) deeply loved scene with its share of disturbing moments uh, (laughs) featuring Harpo and Chico and Mrs. Whitehead and Mrs. Rittenhouse eventually playing bridge. (laughs) (laughs) One of my favorite mark scenes maybe my all-time favorite then groucho's nowhere to be seen i imagine them doing this on stage you know just every night it must have been like some improv going on it does have a very relaxed quality doesn't it that a lot of their a lot of their sequences don't don't particularly it doesn't feel uh you know tightly packed and rehearsed it 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 does have a lovely uh kind of laid back feel we should point out that margaret irving who plays mrs whitehead is, is also from the stage uh version Yes, indeed. And she's good. She's uh, like a, an, a, a secondary Dumont, um, and, and she's very, makes a, a good impact. Um, also, that a lot of the material in this scene is already vintage stuff by 1930. Um, not, it was never, as far as I know, a bridge game previously. Um, but in I'll Say She Is, there was a poker game that had a lot of the same gags in it. Um, Harpo's, uh, unique way of shuffling cards and you know a lot of the card gags with with harpo and chico and i i believe that material goes back even before i'll say she is um to on the mezzanine and perhaps even home again um so it is definitely material that they have honed on stage for yeah. many years if i ever had a time machine i'd love to go back and hear the audience reaction when harpo winds up and just punches uh, Mrs. Rittenhouse and you know, lifts her up into the air. Are people like gasping? Are they laughing? Are they? What's the audience reaction? Do they know what to do? 
It seems, I don't know if it is, but it seems almost like a deliberate test of how much Harpo can get away with. (laughs) Well, if they put it in, maybe it got a lot of laughs on stage, too. They must have taken their best stuff and put it in there, right? It's definitely in the script, exactly as, you know, as, as we see it in the film. And it's a real, that's a great point, Heidi, that if it wasn't a big success with audiences, I'm sure they wouldn't have stopped for it because it is a big, loud moment. It really stops the show. It would be embarrassing to go through that every night if you weren't getting big laughs. Even if you were. <laughs> <laughs> and what makes it even better is that not 30 seconds after this is over, they're like, okay, let's sit down and play cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The two ladies are so polite. They're willing to go through with this. I mean, they are given every indication that they're not playing a straight game with, with reasonable players. What? You mean yeah. there's not four ace of spades? <laughs> you know, that makes this scene a pretty good example of that that Gilbert and Sullivan dynamic that Scott Ratner is always telling us about, you know, here it's not Groucho, but Harpo and Chico are getting that same sort of endless deference. You know, I will sit here and act as though we are playing a game of bridge the way people, reasonable people would in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to acknowledge that you are obviously frauds and cheats. That's the thing, isn't it? They're, They're challenging social convention by being as overt as they possibly can you know but they're not being subtle in any way that they're, they're going as far as they possibly can to see just how much these these stuff shirts will put up with well this is this is when i remember my college days and i went to school in chicago and studied with people who did second city and improv and you're always supposed to say yes and and you don't say no but and you don't say you're cheating bye bye like right away you you kind of go along with it that's what margaret dumont does yeah and 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 it's important isn't it that she finally gets gets cross gets fed up and and leaves when the scene ends not when <laughs> she's received the worst indignity you know she she's she's sticking around after that pummeling <laughs> But, it, but it's a, the relatively mild annoyance at the end of the scene is enough to, to send her on her way. I just imagine that they did this like hundreds of times on stage. I'm guessing they worked it out where everything was just building, building, building to a fever pitch. And they knew exactly what was the right time for her to throw her cards <laughs> down and, and storm off. Uh, well, the movie stays with Harpo and Chico uh, after this scene. And we get their efforts to replace the painting. Uh, with the the painting that Lillian Roth has given to Chico Mm -hmm. that John Parker painted. And I guess the first stretch of comedy material we have in this sequence is the the scene in which Chico asks Harpo for a flashlight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, I really love this. It's one of my favorite Harpo devices and also one of my favorite Harpo and Chico film encounters. To me, it is a much, much better version of the kind of thing that'll happen in later films with charades games, you know? Yeah. Um, a communication challenge between Harpo and Chico, but in this case, capitalizing not on the fact that Harpo uh, goes to great effort sometimes not to speak. Uh, here, the gag is that he's got everything in his coat. Um, and it's and it's verbal comedy. I mean, it could be a scene with Groucho and Chico uh, without the props. Right. I mean, it's a combination of Harpo not understanding and Chico not being precise enough with his language. So the uh, yeah, so the confusion is more understood rather than somebody's an idiot. Very true. Uh, yes, and at the moment when uh, Chico finally gets frustrated and releases a list of all the things, you know, you give me the flush, the flutes, the and Harpo in that rhythm starts playing the flute along with Chico's patter. Uh, it's one of those sublime moments. Not only is it just so good and funny, it's so Marx Brothers. You can't imagine other comedians finding themselves in that gag. Mm-hmm. I want to mention that this scene contains uh, my wife, Amanda's favorite or one of her favorite moments in all the Marx Brothers films. And it's when Harpo is up on the ladder dealing with the painting. The lights have gone out. Um and Harpo is making noise. Chico is worried that they're going to be discovered. And Chico shouts a reassurance to Harpo. He says, I know where you are. 
which has uh, never stood out to me as particularly a laugh line until Amanda started when, as I, you know, we've watched Animal Crackers many times together now and always, always makes her laugh. And I can, through her, her experience of it, I see why that's so funny. Mm-hmm. For one thing, it's very sweet. You know, it's just that Harpo needs this reassurance and Chico is letting him know, we're good. I, I see you. You're okay. I've got you. Um, in the stage script, there's a little clarification that I don't think is obvious in the film, which is that Harpo is using the flashlight to sort of send up a flare and to let Chico know where he is. And Chico is telling him, you can stop doing that with the flashlight. I know where you are. Ah, okay. Ah. okay. Um, well, while the lights are off, confusion reigns, and not only in the intentional plot of the film, uh, there is another thing going on here, um, and you can find all over the internet many explanations of how it's really Margaret Dumont and Chico's costume or something. Matthew, help us. <laughs> yes. Um, well, yeah. The 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 mysterious um, the mysterious Groucho who clearly isn't. Groucho, um, why isn't it, and 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 who is he? Um, I, I can tell you who it isn't. Zappo, <laughs> please, please let this let this die here. The idea that it that it might be Zappo. Um, I, I remember the first time that I saw the the um, archaic showbiz maxim "never work with children or animals" being attributed to uh, to W. C. Fields. So that that made me laugh at the time. Um, I, I was laughing less when it made its way into the pages of Sight and Sound magazine. So 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 let's let's let this one die here. Um, the, the the reason we know it's it's not Groucho is because we can see the guy's face. So look at his face. What part of that face? could possibly be Zeppo. It, it, it's not Zeppo. But who is it? Well, there are all sorts of reasons why it's not the Marx Brothers. Um, we know that there was a problem filming it originally with, a, with a, ironically, a real electrical storm at the same time interfering with the, with the filming. And we know that at the time of the reshoots, Harpo certainly um, was ill. And they must have thought, what you know, why why would we want, would we want to pay the Marx Brothers at their rate of salary when they're in the dark? So let's use somebody else. It is the real Marx Brothers voices. Um, I ha- I think they did a, a, an early take where they were very happy with it, but for some reason visually they needed to redo it. Yeah. So they used the original audio, but the Marxists were not available t- to do the visual, and they figured, who's going to know? Wait a minute. Did you just say there was a real storm? Yeah. I was actually doing research for Matthew's book about this scene, trying to figure out who the doubles were. And I came across an article. I can't recall if it was a trade paper or a newspaper, but it talked about how they actually had to stop filming this particular scene because of a a real storm in the area. And um, I'm not sure... When they picked up filming again, the article doesn't say. I'm not sure if it was later that day or sometime later. But uh, my hunch is that the Marxes weren't available. And uh, they just figured, okay, well, it's going to be dark anyhow. Nobody's going to see who's there. So we'll just dress up someone uh, in their costumes. Yeah, ironically, one of the, one of the reasons that I've seen put forward for for why it is Zeppo is because you can tell that it's not Groucho's voice. Uh, it is Groucho's <laughs> voice, um, but it's not just it's not just Groucho. Groucho, Harpo, and Chico are, are all doubled. Um, who who is it? Um, it's not Zeppo. There's a vague possibility it might be Arthur Sheikman, but uh, my feeling is uh, that it's that it's their their stand-ins. <clears throat> Obviously, they had stand-ins. Um, not 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 stunt doubles, but but guys who were just paid to 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 take their place on the set while they were setting up and fixing the lighting and so on. So my my guess is 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 that's who they are. Um, who are who is Groucho? I don't know. Um, in my book, I suggest it's the former uh, lead actor, now fallen on hard times, um, Henry Van Bowsen. Um, we now know, unfortunately, that it, that it's not him. He is in the film. He is an extra. 
we've been able to pick him out of the crowd. Uh, but 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 he, he definitely isn't Groucho. So the name of Groucho stand-in uh, still eludes us. But Chico is, is Paki Ogassi, who was a former boxer and I think a friend of Chico's. Um, and we can pick him out as well as an extra in the crowd scenes. He's standing directly behind Chico in, in some, some key moments. Um, and Harpo is a guy called um, Jack Cooper. Obviously not not the famous actor Jackie Cooper, but but a guy called Jack Cooper, and that's my guess as as to who we're seeing. It's much more obvious that it's not the Marxes if you look at the old DVD version of the film. Uh, when they remastered the film for Blu-ray, they printed the scene a lot darker, so it's a lot harder to see through the shadows and everything. But if you want to look into this and try and still frame it or brighten it up and look at this closely, use the old DVD version of the film. And that's interesting. I, I want to add just parenthetically that it, because it does seem like the scene's been darkened for the restoration and that makes a lot of sense. But mostly in the restoration, they have opted much more for restoring it to its original release mm-hmm. than correcting mistakes. And right. they've actually restored some mistakes yeah. that were taken mm. out, like <laughs> Groucho getting out of the sedan chair twice. Yeah. Um, uh. Don't get me started. I saw that. <laughs> it's fun living yeah, with I mean, an they've... editor. He notices all of that. <laughs> well, it doesn't take a, it doesn't take a master editor to, to notice that. <laughs> I guess I just don't pay attention. I mean, I watch. I just enjoy it. I I don't let that get in the way. But <laughs> you notice, like, if you get too tuned into continuity errors in movies, you start to notice them in real life too. No, like, don't those aren't the that. pants you were wearing. Yeah, I hate ago. when what? people get out of the car twice. I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, wasn't the sun over here a minute ago? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, are we done with uh, the, our scene in the dark? Just one other thought I had. I'm curious whether they perhaps shot this thing with absolutely no lights. Uh, you know, basically a black screen. And then realize, well, maybe we better have something there. So they decided to redo it with uh, some shadowy figures. And That's a that got me to yeah. thinking, I wonder how it was done on stage on Broadway. Maybe all the lights in the theater were shut off or all the stage lights were shut off and you didn't see anything. I'm just curious about this whole bit. I wonder what I wonder about that, too. And I don't remember how they handled it in the 92 production that I saw sometimes in the theater they'll when a scene calls for the lights to go out and the action to continue they'll do a blue out or something like that you know the stage is bathed in dim blue light um so that you can still see what's happening and Mm -hmm. it reads as darkness somehow Mm -hmm. um well that brings us into this uh wonderful salon scene around Mrs. Rittenhouse's piano. Uh, And uh, this is another one of the, I mean, just about any comedy scene in this movie, we could say this, but this is just so, um, it's pluperfect, you know, and it's one of those times when the films make you feel very much like you're watching them on stage. Mm -hmm. It's, It's literally the Marx Brothers entertaining at a party. And it could be a short. It really could. It, if you think those, uh, particularly those those um, Robert Benchley films where he's mm-hmm. playing uh, an annoying um, official person like uh, Opening Day or um, How to Vote, it yes. could easily be a, a, a very sophisticated uh, New york short film, couldn't it, in its own right? You know, what's funny is when I was watching it, I thought that, but I also thought these could be like memes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the the speech about exploring Africa is like, uh, you know, stand-up comedy. (laughs) And do we have any idea why Zeppo wasn't invited to this uh, shindig? Or to the opening of the uh, the unveiling of the painting itself. He's he's the only person in Rittenhouse Manor who isn't there. We haven't seen him since the first scene. Yeah, his job is just to get there early and make sure no one's a tramp. And uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but back to Roger's great speech about his uh, feats in Africa. It's so curious that there's at least one or two lines in here that are way more blue than other things that had been cut out. And it just shows how random some of this stuff is. Mm. We took some pictures of the native girls, but they weren't developed. But we're going back again in a couple of weeks. A and very show- electing speech, Captain. And I think it's it's a reflection of the just the haphazard way that, that this film was censored. That, 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 you know, I think I'll try and make a 
was taken out and that wasn't. Yeah. It probably just passed them by. Or, you know, at this point in the film, they're probably just concentrating on it less, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, s- somewhere my love lies sleeping with a male chorus. Yeah. Is, <laughs> perhaps even yeah. more so. Yeah. 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 Um, Chico's piano solo here, too, is... Uh, Notably different than most of his other solos, um, as amusing as they always are, he, usually he just sits down and plays a song and there's a few gags in it. But this is really more of a piano piece, you know, he stops and talks during it. He plays mm. a few different things. Um, the, the Chico melody that he plays most prominently that probably after Captain Spaulding is the piece of music most associated with the Marx Brothers, is Chico's composition, I'm Daffy Over You, which is often mistaken for the similar sounding but much later song, Sugar Time. Um, and uh, we might mention that it's just not in the stage script. Um, doesn't mean it wasn't developed as part of the stage show, but uh, in the stage script, it just says that Chico plays um, gypsy love song which happens to be what he plays in coconuts on film uh his which his i think is because here. that that was what he was most familiar with when he was filming coconuts isn't it, it that that's oh, the sure. piece he'd, he'd he'd perfected uh, so he he must have thought well i'll I, I may as well do that now and then when time came to film animal crackers of course he'd already done that so mm-hmm. he had to come up with something else yeah, and what, yet what he plays here, Silver Threads Among the Gold, is he had been playing that since, I believe, Home Again. Um, that's the other piece that he plays here, besides I'm Daffy Over You. Uh, he goes into this more rhapsodic, sort of uh, classical inflected piece, uh, which is which is called Silver Threads Among the Gold. Do you think maybe he just loves playing I'm Daffy Over You? Like, he, it, it's like chopsticks to him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's also spoken material around it. All the great stuff. I can't think of the finish. Um, if you get near a song, play it. You know, none of that's in the stage script. Um, although I, th- I think it is in the stage script now that you can license and produce. But it's not in the original stage script. Um, and some of that stuff is just golden. The other jokes, uh, my fate is in your hands, somewhere my love lies sleeping. That That is in the original Kaufman and Riskin. Mm-hmm. Tell me this, then. You, you'll know this, Noah. Um, did he write I'm Daffy Over You a long time earlier, or is this roughly uh, when it was fir- when it first appeared? Because what, I, what I'm wondering is that a huge part of the joke in this scene is that he's playing a circular piece of music, uh, a, a refrain that, that just goes back on itself over and over again. That's a, that's a that's a joke in for which that piece of music is ideally suited. Was that a coincidence? That's such a good question, and I sure wish I knew the answer. I should. <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can quickly um, get a copyright date on I'm Daffy over you. While you're doing that, I, I just want to say um, that song, that Daffy over you, like it's haunted me for years. Like, Mm. I just always, I'm, I'm singing it, and I'm like, wait, it's this other song, and I have, like, my own lyrics to it, and it drives Bob crazy. I think that Chico was robbed, because, like, this other song was in the 50s? Like, who was his lawyer? Mm. Like, I, I mean, this really sounds exactly like it. Yeah. They found a finish for it, I guess. <laughs> 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 and Chico could be litigious, you know. I mean, there was the lawsuit over the use of his um, as a character in the in the Rhapsody yeah. in Blue film. Why he he must have heard that song and thought, you know, I can make a bit of cash because yeah. this is exactly like my 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 piece. Yeah, you would think so. Hmm. Uh, I regret to say I was not able to find a quick answer regarding the actual origins of Chico's composition here. It wasn't published until the '30s, and that's the copyright date on it. Because I just I wonder if he sat down and deliberately came up with a circular tune, you know, to to fit the scene. It's interesting how when he first starts playing it, the very first time he goes into it, there's instantly a reaction, especially from Dumont and Groucho. They're sort of immediately appalled by what they're hearing. <laughs> yes. and it's, it's kind of like that they were expecting um, something more refined, more artful, more mm. classical, and what they're getting is mm. this kind of. Um, music hall sort of sound. Mm. Sounds like pianola music, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a little like chopsticks, I mean. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Like a practice piece. I once kept this up for three days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I once um, I was involved in a in a, a play that some students w were doing, and we um, we actually we took a section of it without without any talking, and looped it. Uh, so it was running for about twenty minutes as the as the as the lead in <laughs> music to to this play, um, and it, yeah, it's it's very very effective. Uh, Ch Chico copyrighted this piece of music twice, pretty much. Uh, there, the "I'm Daffy over you" is how we usually talk about it. But he also wrote a song called "Lucky Little Penny" that is basically the same tune, a look, just slightly different, um, and and a different lyric. Um, and the fact that Chico wasn't above copywriting this piece of work twice makes it all the more <laughs> mysterious that he didn't go after <laughs> yeah. the writers of Sugar Time. He should have sued them twice, yeah. Uh, yeah. At one point, uh, later when Chico returns to this theme, Harpo gets up to exit the same way he did in Coconuts in the party scene. During all the speeches, Harpo keeps this incredible wince spreads out across Harpo's face and he gets up sort of <laughs> I don't even know how to describe him, but you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. We get a reprise of that bit here. Mm -hmm. And Harpo also gets a little time at the piano. Does this go back to like their childhood of entertaining each other? And now it's your turn, now it's my turn. Yeah, I think so. It, it certainly feels that way. Um, at any time Harpo and Chico are involved together in playing music, it always feels like, well, these two brothers are are at home together now, aren't they? Mm -hmm. As we uh, move on from the uh, the salon scene, uh, Groucho presents Margaret Dumont with a magnificent chest. <laughs> Wait, they're fighting. That was fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. The fighting around the piano and, and the anvil chorus makes a return. Mm -hmm. Fresh from coconuts. Now this chest thing that uh, Spalding presents to uh, Mrs. Rittenhouse, it's, it's a little curious. It, it seems like this whole bit is over so quickly. They come over there, he makes a gag, and then basically they move on. I have a hunch that at some point there might have been more to it. Uh, it's something that seems like it's missing here. Mm. Yes. Well, in my mind, and perhaps in the minds of, of other fans too, um, Harry Ruby pops out of that chest <laughs> and asks, where's my bathroom? <laughs> uh, it's true. It does. We do breeze past it pretty quickly. Although I always feel when we get to this part of this film, uh, this is where I start paying attention to incidental gags, under the breath comments. I feel like this is where the film gets even more crowded, maybe because we're not so much in big block comedy pieces anymore. It's a much more conversational film from here on. We sort of move through scenes that have comedy in them. And so all oh, that's Groucho's Prince Albert uh, run, you know, lots of this stuff that it doesn't jump out and announce itself as great comedy but mm -hmm. if you pay close attention there's so much going on and also here we have a lovely example of one of my favorite things that groucho does sometimes which is also i've probably said this before uh, is also something that spike milligan was famous for doing which is r r he would write a joke in milligan's case it's even more strange because he was his own writer uh, he would write a comprehensible joke which he would then deliver but get bored with in rehearsals so that by the time it it arrived on television he'd rewritten it at least once probably twice and it no longer made any sense at all <laughs> and then there's a there's um a, a lovely example here with the with the magnificent chest which in the play script uh, he describes as being a matchbox for an elephant which is a reasonably funny perfectly understandable joke but it's somewhere along the line Groucho's got bored with this and it's now a hope chest for a guinea pig <laughs> which doesn't mean any anything at all but is just extremely funny yeah there's something about the confidence of this like if enough of these gags are richly brilliant it get, you get to the point where anything Groucho says is richly brilliant in this movie <laughs> I, I love when he says it comes a little bit later than this when he says, I didn't come here to be exonerated. <laughs> I mean, what's the joke? He's just yes. using a word that isn't the right word. Uh, but it seems so funny uh, the way he delivers it with such vehemence. And in the play script, it's, I didn't come here to be distributed. Right. <laughs> it's the same non-joke, but just a different Yes. Word. Um, the painting is unveiled um, at last. Is that where we are? Yeah, the painting yeah. is finally unveiled and the lights go out again. Do we ever get any type of understanding about why the lights went out and the painting was nabbed at that particular moment? Who decided to do that and why? We never get an explanation. Not a coherent one, no. 
That's kind of correct, though, right? We get just enough of this plot for it to serve its purpose to bring the Marx Brothers on for their scenes. But yeah. I'm not sure it really holds up as a way of stealing a painting. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I've just seen too many MGM films. I need logic. I need answers. Come on. Okay. <laughs> this is where we have some intrigue with Hives and, and Grace and Mrs. Whitehead and the chloroform. Which he just happens to have in his pocket. You never know when you're going to need it. And he says to Mrs. Whitehead, you want to try some? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take two hits and pass it. <laughs> also, I always notice the way Hives, when he's going to get the painting... He opens the door to what I guess is his quarters. He opens the door, he looks in, and he says, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. That's the effort you went through to hide this valuable thing you've stolen? Was it just he lying He actually had on it the on desk? display in there. <laughs> he had it on the wall. <laughs> um, it, partly the strange structure of this film and the way things have been cut and shuffled around and added, it always is surprising to me when we get to Why Am I So Romantic, the love duet, that we haven't heard it yet. It feels late in the film for this, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, if it wasn't this late in the film, all the songs would be right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, it is a terrific song, though, isn't it? Mm. All the boys I've known Used to say I was made of stone I would always leave them alone In despair I've been on the path I've been called an electric fan, told I'm even much colder than frigid I began to wonder if I was all wrong. I thought so till you came along. Tell me, dear, why am I so Why am I so romantic? What a grand feeling When your lips meet mine That certain something comes stealing Up and down my spine You know, while we're talking about the song, I can't help but bring up this wonderful set. It's They're hanging out by some orb with some yeah, futuristic that? chairs around there. I don't know what's going on. It's our deco, on. right? Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know what this thing is. It looks like the orb from Sleep. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, and this delightful musical number is followed by the same delightful musical number, now played by Harpo on the harp. And mm -hmm. I think uh, one of his loveliest solos. Yeah, he was a hired musician. He, I don't know if he was hired, though, played by himself like that, but... <laughs> Uh, I like the way he yawns at the end of this solo. Uh, often Harpo, when he gets to the end of a harp solo, he does this signature move where he poses like a prize fighter. He leaps to his feet and puts his fists in the air like he's like he's just won a match. Uh, but in this case, maybe because he is playing alone for himself at the end, he just he yawns contentedly as as we fade to black. You know, that's actually a plot point because the next scene, it's supposedly it's the next day, so they needed the transition because it was the party that night, and now the next scene takes place the following day. So they, they Oh, and he's asleep on the bench. Yeah, it? yeah. So. Yeah, ah, uh, yeah. Good point, yeah. I remember thinking it was a nice transition. And the music, it sounds so, to me, it just sounds modern. He certainly finds layers in these songs. I mean, the way he plays this here, the way he plays Everyone Says I Love You, and Horse Feathers, you know, th there's a lot, these songs have a lot in common, t t tonally. Um, and Harpo turns them into these kind of almost eerie, beautiful, rhapsodic, um, they sound introspective in some way, if you can describe instrumental music as sounding introspective. He just deepens everything he plays. My mom used to say, when you do something really well, it looks easy. And they make it look easy um, when Chico plays and with the little gun moves and everything. And, and it's almost like he enjoys it with his fingers and they just flow. And, and, and Harpo, too, like it, they just make it look easy. I think the novelty of seeing someone play a musical instrument on film with synchronized sound is one of the reasons why all these films are so happy to stop for Harpo or Chico mm -hmm. to just play something, um, you know, it was um, not only is their playing great, and if you saw them on stage, you'd be mesmerized, but 
the magic trick of film conveying something like that was probably still very much on people's minds when these movies were new. You mm-hmm. think of people who were out in the middle of nowhere. They weren't going to New York. This must have been great. Yeah, like a cultural sampler, you know, you get these comedy scenes, but there's also pop songs and there's instrumental performances. Yes, it's an evening of entertainment um, and not just a story, which is kind of what happens uh, as as the, the medium uh, develops. Uh, well, the sun comes up and it's morning at Rittenhouse Manor, um, which gives us uh, one of my favorite of the restored lines that is back now for the restored version, which is when Lillian Roth tells Chico that she's been looking for him all morning. And Chico says, I was busy this morning, but you could have had me last night. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that all these lines that we haven't heard a million times yeah. are all slightly blue. I mean, very tame. But it's it's doubly uh, exciting that we get a, a new joke now and then, and it's just ever so slightly dirty. But do you ever wonder, I mean, since they were appealing to everybody, there was no... Our ratings, right? I mean, it was it was for everyone. When we watch kids' films, there's always those jokes for the grown-ups, and so this gives the grown-ups something to laugh at. So, but actually, unlike their later films, this wasn't even pretending to be a family film. You know, this wasn't like at the circus, like bring the kids, you'll have a great time. This was this Broadway show brought to the screen for adults. I mean, they had these funny costumes on, but the, there there was nothing really in the show for kids. So who so, went to the show? Did the, no kids, I mean, I mean, this was, this was on Broadway. I don't know. Who, who, yeah, the boat was quite yeah. late at night, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think my, my understanding is that, although I'm sure there were children who got to see the Marx Brothers on Broadway, yeah. for the most part, like family activity, I don't think was practiced in the same way that it is now in our time. I, I don't think taking the kids to the theater with you is something that was that widely done. I think the kids, you know, stayed home with someone taking yeah. care of them and going to the theater, going out for dinner, going to parties. These were adult activities. I'm sure that's not 100% true, but I think it was truer then. And, um, and, and maybe that also, even if there are exceptions to that and, um, you know, plenty of people who did take their kids to Broadway in the 20s, um, I still suspect the people who created these shows weren't thinking of kids as part of their audience when they, when they wrote them. It's interesting to me because, you know, you watch that and it's like, okay, there's a little blue humor in here, right? And mm. then, like, I watched Grease and then I watched it again with my kids and I was like, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff that went right over my head. It's filthy, isn't it? It's Grace? filthy. Yeah. And then, Amazing. Like, so, I saw it when I was five. Yeah, so if you're like, say that you're in the 80s watching the Marx Brothers uh, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's funny that people think that's blue. And then mm-hmm. now we're in a place where, like, everything seems to be getting canceled. And <laughs> it's just like, oh, you can't have a shooting scene. Mm. <laughs> you can't drug everyone at the end, Bill Cosby. You know, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> and so, like, we're like, <laughs> we've gone, like, full circle. It's really kind yeah. of bizarre what mm, we're doing. Yeah. And I, they yeah. just can't ruin the Marcus Brothers for me. Like, don't. Oh, that that scares the crap out of me. Well, I'll push back on this just slightly. I mean, the it is true that uh, times and mores change, and our ideas of what's what's broadly offensive and what's acceptable is always in flux. And I guess the reputations or the um, critical status of certain comedians or other kinds of artists, you know, changes with the times. Like somebody's thing it seems to really match the way people are feeling right now and their mm-hmm. popularity rises and times change again. And we no longer quite want to hear what that artist is saying because it doesn't feel as true as it used to but it's really i i can't think of many classic films that have been actually removed from circulation for that reason by anyone other than the rights holders i mean right. disney right. decides like we don't want song of the south to be to have our name on it and and, and be out there but i, I and, but i really do not think that, i think there's some danger of interest in the marx brothers eventually being 
too low for their films to be easy to find, um, although films are easy to find these days. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like Gone with the Wind is the classic example of a movie that is a beloved classic that has been considered one of the greatest. I mean, it is also from many reasonable points of view, a, a deeply offensive film that has taken a lot of criticism and that is now usually preceded by a sort of warning notice that says exactly what you're saying. This was made in a different time and it reflects the attitudes of that time. I, I really don't think we have anything to worry about that the Marx Brothers films will be, you know, removed from availability because of changing mores. I think you're right, but I think you're only really right because they now play to a, 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 a very small niche audience that know exactly what they're getting and, and sort of a, a part of a part of a separate world. I think if these were films from, say, the 1970s or the early 1980s that were still getting regular TV exposure at, at peak times, um, I think I think they would be at much greater risk. Hmm. And I don't think we're too far off from some of them at least getting a disclaimer at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that doesn't bother me. I mean, I think that's the correct way to deal with this stuff. That's the way to keep the movies available, not not remove or censor them, not deny people the opportunity to see them, but attach uh, an innocuous 30 seconds of text on the screen to say, uh, we know, we know, we get it. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting. I, I I don't have television, so I'm I I only occasionally see television on occasions like, for instance, last week when I was uh, on holiday in a in a hotel room. I, I I put it on, and it's quite interesting that I I watched um, Dirty Harry, uh, or some of Dirty Harry, um, which when I first saw that on television um, on BBC television, I was I was quite stunned when I eventually saw the, the, the video of it because almost all the violence had been either taken out or massively toned down to the point that some bits of it didn't quite make sense. The scene where he's torturing the, the killer in the football stadium, you, you, you couldn't quite work out what was going on there because they took all the detail out of that. The the final close-up of his, of his uh, grotesquely beaten face when he pays to have himself beaten up that was missing so when that came up on the video that was a real shock um and i was watching it in a hotel room uh, last week uh, and all the violence that was missing is now back in there but but loads and loads of dialogue was missing uh like for instance the, you know the famous scene where he says why do you why do you call him dirty harry and uh the guy says oh he hates everybody and then and then lists a variety of of you know uh, racial slurs among other among other among other types of people that had been stripped uh the the racial slur in scorpio's le letter had been bleached out so that so it made it simply made no sense it had actually uh, you know they they they'd taken it to a point where people would be scratching their head thinking what on earth is going on here and and it just struck me as odd you know that that all that violence was back that wasn't a problem I mean, these things change, you know, they change with the wind, and uh, it's strange. Yeah, it's always been a, a strange irony of censorship that brutal violence has usually been more acceptable than two people in love uh, yeah. <laughs> expressing <laughs> their attraction for each other. Well, back to Animal Crackers, I guess. Yes, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's, I, I think I'm responsible for the digression. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how we got here. I was busy this morning, but you could have had me last night. <laughs> uh, there's uh, some some good stuff here with Zeppo, uh, finally, um, getting toward the hunger dunger scene, which is one of those times when Zeppo gets to actually do a little comedy. Um, before we talk about that, I just want to call attention to... Dumont's concern that her party isn't going well, the painting's been stolen, and Captain Spaulding is reportedly not in a good mood. Zeppo looks at her and summons every bit of his acting ability, and he tells her he had a very bad night. <laughs> what did that look like? I wish I could know more about this very bad night that Spaulding and Jamison went through together. <laughs> he went out horseback riding in the middle of the night. He was listening to the harp, and, yeah. <laughs> and he looked out, and he said, what is that spare doing there? What the heck? <laughs> um, and this, this dictation scene, uh, this, is a, this is another one. This is a great comic scene. It has the added 
novelty of, of being a Groucho and Zeppo scene. Uh, but it's wonderful. And uh, as with other parts of the movie, some, some good jokes have been restored. And Zeppo, who we welcome back here, making his second appearance in the film over an hour after his first. Doing his job again, though. <laughs> is there any question that this is the uh, the highlight of his career, the, this scene? He has lines that actually make you laugh, and, and it's intentional as opposed to mm. the unintentional laughs he often gets. Yes, like asking Groucho if he wants his throat clearing in the letter. Right. And scratch Elsie, of course. It's such an irony that one of one of his uh, one of his few genuinely funny moments hit hit the uh, hit the censor's floor for so many years. Yeah, though anyone who who hasn't seen the restored version, one more reason for you to to uh, rectify that problem is uh, there's there's a lot more or a little more to this scene, uh, a series of jokes that we've referred to as scratching Elsie. Elsie being one of the recipients that Groucho mentions of this letter, and then when her name being omitted comes up, the idea of scratching Elsie becomes a another mildly vaguely sexual uh, joke. Um, now, this line was, we knew about this before it was restored, partly from the stage script, but also because it was quoted in publicity materials. Is that right, Matthew? Mm. Yeah, they, there's a there's a, an ad where they, they've all got speech balloons and, and their most kind of defining line is quoted and, and his is Scratch Elsie. So, so, you know, for 60 years, people must have looked and thought, what the hell is that? Why is he yeah. saying Scratch Elsie? <laughs> Well, now uh, Ed Metcalf shows up as Detective Hennessy. Uh, this is missing from the original stage script. The original stage script doesn't have the character of Hennessy, nor any police officer who shows up at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't have Harpo's knife dropping routine mm-hmm. either. Um, now, all of that is now in the stage version, and, and it was in 1992. And I think this is not, I don't know this, but... I think it's a reasonable guess that it probably or perhaps was added to the stage production after it had opened. Um, Mm -hmm. It was such a a signature bit. It had been part of Home Again on the Mezzanine, Coconuts, uh, Mm -hmm. I'll Say She Is. I suspect it was added to the stage Animal Crackers by popular demand. Sure seems like it. yeah. 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 But it's not in the script or in the opening night program. There's no Hennessy listed among the uh, characters. Uh, But it is great to see Ed Metcalf. He is a major Marx Brothers player. This is his only film appearance with them. Um, But he played basically this role uh, all the way back to home again in their vaudeville act. He was a major part of their stock company. Uh, And he also has this additional claim to fame of being the person who first introduced Groucho to the works of Gilbert and Sullivan. And so it's great to be able to see and hear him and, and know who he is. There's a lot of people who were prominent parts of the Marx Brothers vaudeville act, but we don't have this kind of knowledge of how they mm. were as performers. Um, the the knife dropping bit itself, although certainly one of the greatest Marx Brothers pieces ever, and I'm very glad it's on film here, I, I feel it doesn't quite come off as great as it should. Um, partly it's a piece that really depends on the momentum of live laughter and partly uh, there's too many cuts in it. You know, just if it were all one long shot, I think we'd get it more, but it keeps yeah. cutting around in ways that diminish it and make it feel like it might be more faked than it is. Maybe they looked at it and figured it didn't play. Or people didn't understand what was going on unless you had the cutaways to it. Because this film has very few cutaways to gags, which is why it works. And so it's a lot of just long, wide shots and just letting the performers carry the moment. But here they have to use a filmmaking tool yeah. to try and get a gag across. It needs to be one long shot, doesn't it? Yeah. One uncut long shot. Otherwise, he could just be refilling his, his sleeve and the whole point is lost. But it's also very, very... The, the, the closer shots are very tightly framed, aren't they? You, you, can, you can only just see... Uh, the stuff coming out, and in fact, in the the, the original versions that I saw on on BBC Television, it was cropped slightly, and the, the bottom of the screen was literally above uh, where. The, so, so for a lot of the scene, we were just hearing it. I haven't seen it in a long time, and when I saw it again, I was like, "Wait, what's going on?" And you you hear it; it's kind of confusing because you're like, "Wait, what was that?" 
Well, that's why I needed the cutaways, actually. So it wasn't really, it wasn't really executed as well as it could have been, which sort of... He may have been just staking his claim to it. It had been starting to turn up being done by other people, including in an earlier film, um, where um, the, the Variety reviewer, I think, made a point of saying, there's this funny moment, but it's a Harpo Marx bit. Um, so he, he, might have, he might have just said, let's do this in the film so, so you know, everybody knows it's mine. By the way, no, I don't know if this was intentional, but you sort of skipped ahead about 20 minutes to the, to the finale, <laughs> which I'm all for. I mean, there's, you know, you've skipped over the, the Groucho Chico scene. I mean, there's there's good oh, stuff. Yeah. There, I mean, there's there's lots of good stuff between, you know, in those last 15, 20 minutes, but it none of it's necessary. By the end of the dictation, I mean, we're ready to wind things up. There's only so many chocolate cream eclairs you can eat in one sitting, I think, is, is yeah. the lesson, isn't it? You do make a good point, Bob. I Skimming my notes, I did sort of skip over some, some things here, um, including the big Groucho Chico scene about building a house next door. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I noticed that I did want to comment on was the way when he's accused of stealing the painting, John Parker does exactly what... Bob Adams does in the coconuts. He immediately, he's not guilty, really, but he immediately starts acting very suspiciously. <laughs> he says, I have nothing to say. <laughs> he, he immediately clams up and becomes like, oh, well, he's obviously guilty, isn't he? <laughs> uh, what is this about the male leads in the male romantic leads in Marx Brothers films not able to act innocent even when they are? No one character knows that there are three paintings do they everyone thinks there's either one or two so he's he assumes that stealing plan that he was a part of is is mm. the big intrigue here yeah. uh is there anything in the groucho chico scene uh, i feel like there's lots of great incidental gags in it even though it's a little flabby compared to what these scenes would become in in later films i i think it's i think it's brilliant T taken out of context it's probably my favorite of, of all their hmm. uh, their dialogues, it's just it's just where it's placed for me. Yeah. So Noah, do you know where was that scene? Was that originally in the beginning or at the end or even there? Or it was in the stage version. It it was pretty much where it is, but it, it's nevertheless was much earlier in the evening because in the stage version, there's a lot more that comes after the movie version ends. There's a whole scene at the end at a costume ball in King Louis's court. It's usually referred to as the Dubarry scene with Mrs. Whitehead as Dubarry. It's really a copy of the Napoleon scene. I mean, a very good, funny, worthwhile version of the same idea from the Napoleon scene. And this was the equivalent, the big dress costume period scene. This is the scene in which they sang the song Four of the Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly wish we had them doing that on film. Um, was any but, of that material or gags from that scene ever repurposed anywhere else in their career? I I don't think so. Not that I can think of. But it's full of great stuff, especially great Groucho lines. Hmm. Um, it's it's you know it, it's a, a good reason to take a look at the stage script of Animal Crackers, the Dubarry scene, like the Napoleon scene. It's this big piece of vintage great Marx Brothers stuff that just isn't on film anywhere. Yeah. Well, as we have been saying, our favorite Marx Brothers film and the greatest example of what was so wonderful about them and this this perfect sublime experience does rather dribble into nothing at the end. And that's kind of where we are now. Um, <laughs> after the knife dropping, um, Harpo with his uh, can of flit that we have seen earlier um, lays waste to the entire party. Uh, including Chico, and uh, and he settles himself down beside the chorus girl of his choice. It starts with an ensemble, and it ends with an ensemble. Oh, that's true. Yeah, a big a big scene with the chorus. So that is how it ended. It was the act two finale of a three act play, oh, right. and the third act was is mostly the um, the Dubarry scene that I described. Uh, this this costume ball, and after the costume ball, there's a very brief return to some of the plot as established <laughs> in the first two acts. But basically, it's like an extra thing at the end, which was fairly common at the time. It was pretty routine, ridiculous as this seems now, for critics to leave before the show was over on opening night in order to meet their deadlines. Hmm. So most of the reviews you read of Broadway shows 
through up to, I don't know, maybe World War II or something, you're reading the opinions of people who did not see the whole play. Why wouldn't they do the opening night started an hour early or something to uh, allow for that? Yeah, that's one of like a dozen better solutions I can think of, but for some reason. <laughs> you know, another reason why I love this film so much is that I think the Marx Brothers never looked better. Their makeup and costumes have reached absolute perfection, at least from as far as I'm concerned. And more importantly, I really think that for the final time on film, they're still youthful. They're still the boys. I mean, yeah. even by monkey business the next year, Groucho has a little bit of gray in his hair. Chico and Harpo have a couple more lines in their faces. Zeppo is a little more bald. But really, for the last time, they're really youthful in their actions and, and in their looks. Very true. <laughs> They're also more realistically photographed, aren't they, in, in yeah. the later ones. It's like the, the, yeah. the transitions to, between uh, Hal Roach, Lauren Hardy, and the later Lauren Hardy. One yeah. reason why it seems so overt is because they're not being theatrically made up anymore and and the lighting and the photography is so much more realistic and sharp. And I think that we see something of that transition between uh, New York Marx Brothers and Hollywood Marx Brothers. It's just so interesting that the three of us while we all agree that perhaps the last 15, 20 minutes is, I don't know, for lack of a better word, disposable, we still think it's our favorite Marx Brothers film, even though it doesn't have that great whiz-bang ending of Duck Soup or Night at the Opera or even Horse Feathers. Um, it just shows how strongly we feel about the first 75 minutes. I certainly don't think it's disposable. I mean, I, I think it's... It, 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 I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have it any other way. And mm. I, I like. I like the effect, as I've said, I think several times, of of, of it basically wearing you down the way mm. that they wear the other characters down. Mm. In in you know you just you just get to a point where you you, just, you put your hands up and you say, okay, you've won. And that, and I, I like you know I do like that effect. Yeah, I'm just saying that if the film ended after the uh, dictation scene, it would still be my favorite. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The weaknesses of this movie are weaknesses that, although obvious, don't have anything to do with what we want or need this film to be. Um, so, I mean, it's not as though Horse Feathers has this satisfying conclusion that makes you feel like you've, uh, you know, arrived somewhere from where you began. Um, it's just this, it's not quite as tight as, as the final stretches of, of the, the next few Paramount films. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all true. You, you can grant every structural criticism and still have the greatest <laughs> possible record of, of this wonderful comedy team. Yeah. I, I, th I think of this film as like a concert film from a rock band. You're seeing them live. You're seeing how they interact. You're seeing the, the performance, the way the audience saw them. Um, the later films, as great as they are, they're they're like studio recordings. They're pieced together meticulously from the best takes, and they're like pieces of a puzzle put together to form a, a great picture. Here you're seeing, warts and all, a live performance. Yeah, I like that. I feel that way about Margaret Dumont, too. She's improvising a little. and I think we have the most prolonged examples in this movie of Margaret Dumont's abilities as an ad libber, um, you know, particularly in the bridge game scene, um, where she has to do an awful lot of vocalizing in response to all the things Harpo and Chico are doing. Um, and she even talked about this in some of her few interviews, uh, that she often had to ad lib in order to buy time for the audience to catch up with the gags. Um, and some of the things she says are really funny in, in their own way. Uh, one thing I wrote down that she says to Mrs. Whitehead at one point during the bridge game, this is during the prize fighter yeah. bit where Chico is acting as Harpo's coach and Harpo is glowering in the chair. Yeah. Um, and Dumont says to Mrs. Whitehead, she says, oh, you see how terrible he looks. I'm so frightened. <laughs> <laughs> I love all that dialogue. Listen, there's like 20 seconds of dialogue of Maggie and Ms. Whitehead just biding time while Harpo is getting ready for the next round. Oh, I must get him out. I must I get him out of here. I'm so frightened. Oh, look, see how terrible he looks. Look. And anybody have closing thoughts on Animal Crackers? Next year it would have been a it would have been a, a part of my life for forty years and I can't I can't imagine them any different. 
Um, I I love that it's my sweetheart's film. Yeah, I sat down last night, then I, I generally laughed a couple of times. There were a few moments I didn't recall or struck me as funny that hadn't been funny before. So it remains my favorite. You laughed a lot of times. Can you tell, what are some examples of things that Bob laughed at last night? <laughs> uh, well, he, he loves that, mm. that bridge scene. Um, I'll tell you what made me laugh. Um, when William Roth is talking to Chico and they're trying to, Chico's trying to figure out who stole the painting and he says, wait, maybe it's that fish man. Maybe he did it. I mean, it's Chandler's painting to start with. How could he steal his own painting? So. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to plug this book too, because. Which book is, which hey, book hey, is that looks it? Good. It's the annotated Marx Brothers. <laughs> um, and, and so a film goer's guide to in jokes, right? So. Bob and I went to a comedy show. We saw Stella, was it, I think? And then there was some guy who was doing the warm-up, and we didn't get anything he was talking about because it was from the next generation. It was, like, about yeah. I'm, about Mario Brothers and like all these things, and we were like, what, what, um, My what? son could you help know? you there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... So I'm watching, you know, Animal Crackers again, and so many things went over my, like, under, over my head, I guess. <laughs> like, I was like, all right, I don't get this joke and that joke, and then I take out the handy-dandy book, which Bob, you know, opened to, um, you know, Animal Crackers, and I get them now, because mm. I didn't live in that time. That was the point of the book. But there's so much that you do get. And that's why it's timeless, too. So they can't, yeah. they can't take that away from us, is all I'm saying. It's very interesting <laughs> to see what things, in, in, you know, in, in the random lottery of, of posterity, what things, you know, uh, uh, some people might get, what things nobody's ever going to get, and what things everybody's going to get. You know, there's no particular reason why a reference to Tarzan will be understood by everybody. But it, it just is because for some reason Tarzan has endured, you know, in, in a way that so many other things from that time haven't. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, it usually falls to our guest to announce the closing music. <laughs> so take it away, Ivy. <laughs> right. I have a lot to choose from. So I'm not going to say the, what I decided first. So I, I like Lydia only because my mom used to sing it with my dad. She's gone now. But why don't we do the Linda McCartney version of Sugar Time? Wait, wait a minute. No, I get to choose. You knock it off. <laughs> I'm the editor. I can do whatever I want. Oh, I'm the wife. That's true. That trumps the editor. You're the boss, okay. but I'm making the decisions. All right. Mm. So <laughs> um, I like is uh, whatever it is, I'm against it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks for having me, guys. This was fun. <laughs> the trustees have a few suggestions they would like to submit to you. I think you know what the trustees can do with their suggestions. I don't know what they have to say. It makes no difference anyway. Whatever it is, I'm against it. No matter what it is or who commenced it, I'm against it. Your proposition may be good, but let's have one thing understood. Whatever it is, I'm against it. And even when you've changed it or condensed it, I'm against it. I'm opposed to it. On general principles, I'm opposed to it. He's opposed to it. In fact, indeed, he's opposed to it. For months before my son was born, I used to yell from night till morn, whatever it is, I'm against it. And I've kept yelling since I first commenced it. I'm against it. Knowing that as I do, I'd not advise you to displease him or tease him. No, no, don't double cross him or toss him around. When dear old dad once gets mad, he's a hound. My son is right, I'm quick to fight, I'm from a fighting clan. When I'm abused or badly used, I always get my man. No matter if he's in Peru, Paducah, or Japan, 
I go ahead alive or dead, I always get my man. I soon dispose of all of those who put me on the pan. Like Shakespeare said to Nathan Hale, I always get my man. The Marx Brothers Council podcast is produced and edited by Bob Gassell. Matthew Conium Spooks, the annotated Marx Brothers, and That's Me Groucho are published by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of All Say She Is, is published by Bear Manor Media. For more info on this and all episodes, visit our website at MarxBrothersCouncilPodcast.com. Also look for us on Twitter. And for the place to talk Marx and meet fellow fans, join us on the lively Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. See you next time! But as it's pretty hard to be wrong if I keep answering myself all the time, let's meet my co-hosts and... Oh, we got somebody at the doorbell. Who's at the doorbell? <laughs> you want to take a minute? It must be the Fuller Brush salesman. <laughs> oh, my God. How do you want to get that? We had a block party yesterday. Some people are maybe returning some chairs or whatever. Coleslaw. <laughs> it yeah. was politics. And not even my politics. Politics at the door. I don't want any. <laughs> <laughs>